Well, hey, welcome to Northeast Online. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us today. And listen, we are just two weeks away from Easter. We are so, so looking forward to celebrating with you and your friends and your family. And uh, just want to encourage you, hey, check out ncclex.org slash Easter. And we want to encourage you to invite someone with you this Easter to join you, whether it's digitally right there online or and to take the step and to come and to worship together in person. And so I want to encourage you to do that, nccleks.org slash Easter. You can also sign up to serve this Easter. Um, man, maybe you're looking for a way to really get involved, kind of take that next step. We have plenty of opportunities for you to help us welcome our community in to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And so looking forward to that. And hey, we're going to worship together um, all, throughout our time today. Uh, but we're going to start off with something really, really exciting and special. Check out this baptism from just a couple weeks ago. Good morning, Northeast. My name is Corey Kamick, and I'm here with my wife, Laura, and our daughter, Quinn, this morning. We're very excited that Quinn gave her life to Christ last Easter, and we're here to baptize her this morning. All right, my beautiful girl, you repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. Son of loving God. Son of the living God. My personal Lord and Savior. My personal Lord and Savior. Death. Burial. Yeah. 
know the Lord is good, then just declare this with me. And I will rest today in your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness, and I will rest in your promises, my confidence only found.
turn it around, God turn it around. Oh God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around.
So, Father, as we worship you today, oh, Heavenly God, how you, how you move our hearts and our minds to a place of, of freedom, God, of joy. No matter what the weeks have to throw, no matter what, no matter what comes up, that we can still trust and know that you are God. And when we declare today what a powerful name, it's not just words. So God, I ask today as we worship, through singing, through prayer, through through communion, man, would none of it go to waste? Would it all be for you? But here today, you are actually turning it around, that you're turning fear into hope. Where trust was lost, you are rebuilding that wall. Families restored in Jesus' name. Marriages restored in Jesus' name, God. still the miraculous. You still do mighty things. So would we just stand in awe and wonder as you move, as you call the dead to life, God. So as we worship here and now through this time of communion, through just remembering that it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the sacrifice that none of us can make, the life that we couldn't live, and the dues that we couldn't pay. So, God, I just thank you. That's all we can do is just offer up thankful praise to you. Thank you for meeting us in our mess, in our brokenness, and just 
sitting and loving us there. All this is for you. It's in Jesus' name. Jesus had entered Capernaum. A centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Well, this is week four of our series called Shoes. And through this series, we're trying on the shoes of various people from the Bible. And the idea here is that you can learn a tremendous amount about a person and their life when you walk for a while in their shoes. The people we're looking at, there are people who had personal encounters with Jesus. And through these messages, we're exploring those experiences these folks had and how it impacted them going forward. These are people who are a lot like us. So our hope is that through this series, we too might have a personal encounter with Jesus. Throughout history, when a nation would invade and conquer another nation, they usually would leave an occupying force there. In the days that when Jesus lived on the earth, the Roman army actually ruled the land where he lived. The Romans had conquered the Greeks, and thus Judea became a Roman province, part of the Roman Empire. The Romans conquered Jerusalem in 63 BC, which brought the region under Roman control. And the main reason to leave a military force in Judea was to keep the peace. But history has taught us that occupying forces over the centuries, they, like the Romans, have often ruled with cruelty and brutality. On top of all that, the Romans also heavily taxed the Jews. All of this went together to lead to a deep resentment toward the Roman soldiers who actually were there in the occupying of the, of the land of Judea. Our story today takes a look at one of those soldiers and we're gonna put on his combat boots just for a little while. His story is found in Matthew, the eighth chapter, starting with verse five. Now, we don't know this soldier's name. All we know is that he's referred to by his rank. He's called the centurion. Now, Romans, Rome's fighting forces were generally organized by legions, which is the equivalent of about 6,000 soldiers. Within each legion, the troops were organized into 60 different groups called cohorts. Each cohort was made up of 100 soldiers and was commanded by a soldier called a centurion. This centurion in our text was stationed in or near the city of Capernaum which is located on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And you can tell from the map, it's actually quite a ways from Jerusalem. It's not far from where Jesus actually delivered the Sermon on the Mount. 
Most Roman soldiers were hated by the Jews for their oppression, their control, and their ridicule. But this specific centurion, he was different. Let's pick up the text in verses five and six of Matthew, the eighth chapter. It says, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Now, there are a number of reasons why the centurion wouldn't have ever approached Jesus. There were things that, like his pride or his doubts, money, language, his own self-sufficiency or power or even race. It seems that much about this man could have kept him from coming to Jesus. You see, he was a professional soldier and Jesus was a man of peace. He was a Gentile, and Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. But none of these things kept him back. Oh, they could have been obstacles from him being with Jesus, but it didn't. You see, this man had one thing working in his favor. He had faith. Later, we will learn that he was a man with great faith, and because of this faith, he didn't let any of these barriers keep him from having an encounter with Jesus. Now, this causes one to wonder, what are the things today that can keep a person from approaching Jesus and having an encounter with him? One of those things is fear. It holds us back. It's easy to be afraid of things we don't understand or don't know much about. So one ends up keeping Christians and churches and the Bible itself all at arm's length, never get close enough to actually have an encounter with Jesus. Another reason is that we might feel like we don't know enough. We don't want to get duped, to, so to speak. We don't want to get taken. There's an old adage that says, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Well, when it comes to spiritual beliefs, there's a lot of us that feel like that. We reject everything because we don't want to get roped into some kind of cult. So they end up ignoring the message of hope completely. Another reason is pride holds us back. We fear what others might think, so we don't make any decisions that might involve us getting involved in a church. And certainly, we don't make a decision to surrender our life to Jesus. We worry that they might think we're weird and thus reject us or decide they don't want to be around us. I recently read about an old carnival headliner. He, was, he had an act. He was called Cannonball. And in his younger days, he was shot out of a cannon 1,200 times over the course of his career. When they asked him why he did it, he said, do you know what it's like to feel the applause of 60,000 people? That's why I did it. It's part of human nature to care what other people think about you. We want them to like us. We love it when they applaud for us. Sadly, many will go to great lengths to be accepted by those that they don't even really respect. I strongly believe we shouldn't give people that much power to influence the decisions, especially the important decisions we make in life. There's a fourth reason. Some don't think that God will accept them. Let me, let me read to you from Romans, the fifth chapter, Verse six and following, listen closely to this. You see, at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you so much that Jesus was willing to die for you. Don't believe for a second that God won't accept you. 
because he will. And then there's a fifth, a fifth answer. Some of us don't believe what God has said. That's why we don't, we don't pursue an encounter with Jesus because we just don't believe it. And you know, that might be the fairest response of all if you've ser- seriously examined the claims that Jesus made, the claims found in the Bible. You see, everyone owes it to themselves to investigate what God has said and what Jesus did. Did it really happen? Is it true? If it's true, then maybe we should put some stock in that. Because if it's true and you never checked it out, how tragic would that be? What do we have to lose to at least take some time to investigate what the Bible claims? Lee Strobel wrote the perfect book for all of us who are skeptical. It's, the book is titled The Case for Christ, and it was written as an investigative reporter or journalist might write something as he examines the evidence of a crime. That's what Strobel did for a long period of time. He was a court, court investigative reporter. This is important. To know this is very important because Jesus has promised that he is coming back. Listen to what we read in 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 10. But when the day of God's judgment does come, it will be unannounced, like a thief. The sky will collapse with a thunderous bang, everything disintegrating in a raging inferno, earth and all its works exposed to the scrutiny of judgment. Jesus is coming back for his people and to judge mankind. So don't put off investigating the claims of Jesus. Well, there's a lot of reasons that keep people from having an encounter with Jesus. And I wonder, is something keeping you from connecting with Jesus? That's a good question to think about. Normally, a centurion would have been excluded by a a Jewish rabbi. A rabbi would have nothing to do with a Roman soldier. But that's not the way Jesus was. Even though the centurion was from a different ethnicity, he was Gentile and Jesus was a Jew, that is not the way Jesus handled it, like a typical rabbi. He would have just excluded the centurion. This encounter gives us a glimpse into a major change that Jesus is ushering in through his ministry, and that is this. The gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. It's not just for the Jews anymore. Every race, tribe, tongue, and nation, no matter where you're from, how you grew up, or the size of your bank account, the gospel is for you. It's for everyone. And it was even for a Gentile occupying soldier in Judea. The centurion came to get help for someone who was important to him. He had a a servant who, for one reason or another, we don't know why, he was paralyzed. And this centurion was so concerned about this servant that he actually comes to meet Jesus. Now, why would a Roman soldier think a rabbi would have the power to heal? Well, if he's simply a pagan soldier, he has no real God-honoring connections. He might have tried everything else, both medical, he may have even gone to his pagan gods for their involvement, and nothing's worked to this point. So he's open to trying this rabbi who's got the reputation of being able to heal people. On the other hand, if he is a God-fearing Gentile, and there were some God-fearing Gentiles, a Gentile who had faith in the God of the Jews, he may believe that God can actually heal his servant, Yahweh, the Almighty One. In either case, this centurion had heard about Jesus. He had heard and he realized that 
Jesus was becoming known for his ability to heal people of all kinds of illnesses, all kinds of disabilities. So he approached Jesus on behalf of his suffering servant and he shows Jesus tremendous respect. In fact, the verb that Matthew uses in verse five where it says asking for help in Greek actually means to express in attitude or gesture one's complete dependence on or submission to a high authority figure. Matthew's letting us in on the attitude of this centurion. He shows Jesus great respect and honor as he asked him for help. Then the centurion doesn't make a formal request. He actually is just asking Jesus to heal him by simply laying before Jesus the situation that his servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. And the word that he uses when he says suffering is actually a reference to the Greek, which means extreme distress. In fact, in some contexts, this word is actually used to describe someone who's being tortured. His servant was in a very bad way. His suffering was so severe that it prompted the centurion to come to Jesus. So Jesus responded to him. Look what verse seven says. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Jesus is willing to go to the servant and actually heal him. This is one of the most admirable qualities about Jesus. He always has time for people. As mentioned earlier in this series, Jesus is very important. He's a busy rabbi and he's equally busy, yet, He always makes time for those who are seeking an encounter with him. Most of the time it's a person who is sick or ailing with a disease or a disability. But in this situation, it's a man asking for someone else. He's asking for his friend who happens to be a servant. And the servant is so sick, he's not able to be there. He can't make the trip. So Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. Jesus is willing to help check out this servant and bring the healing he needs. Well, look what the centurion says in verse eight. He says, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus is willing to go to the centurion's home and heal the servant, but the centurion knows that Jewish people weren't allowed to enter into the home of a Gentile. The result would be they would be unclean, and it appears he doesn't want to put Jesus in that awkward position. The centurion says he's not worthy to have Jesus visit his home. Instead, he recognizes the authority Jesus has as a healer. He knows that if Jesus just says the word, then his servant will be healed. Now here's the centurion's logic. It's it's found in verse nine. He says this, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one to go and he goes, and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. He does it. The centurion uses basic reasoning by comparing the authority he had as a military commander, having soldiers under his authority who would carry out his orders, and he compares that with the great authority that Jesus possessed. You see, if Jesus gave the order, then the centurion's servant would be healed. He knows that if Jesus just gives that command, then that disease would have to obey him. This part of the story really got me thinking this week. I mean, when I pray, how confident am I that Jesus will respond? I mean, this centurion is really dialed in. He is very confident that Jesus can just speak the word and his servant will be healed. But I was wondering, what about me? 
What about you? How much faith do we have? It got me thinking about a man who had an encounter with Jesus who sought help from Jesus to heal his son, who suffered from the results of an evil spirit. He would, see, he would cause seizures that would cause this young boy all kinds of problems. In Mark the ninth chapter, verse 21 and following, let me read this story to you very quickly. He said, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire, into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, if you can do anything, he says to Jesus, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. The man admitted that his faith was weak. And he wasn't even sure Jesus could do anything. But Jesus assured him he could, if the man would just believe that he could. The Bible says that immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And although the man's faith was weak, Jesus still healed his boy. And the result was that the man's faith grew stronger. Although the the father had weak faith, he had his faith in the right person, Jesus. If your faith is in Jesus and in him alone, not in yourself or not in other people or not in things of this world, but in Jesus, also notice that your faith can grow. This man sincerely wanted a stronger faith, Don't be satisfied with a weak faith. This man wasn't. He begged Jesus, help me with my unbelief. Don't be satisfied with a weak faith that comes and goes, but grow stronger in your faith by meeting with Jesus daily. Spend time reading his word, the Bible. Spend time praying, praying with faith, worshiping and fellowshipping with other believers. Your faith will grow as a result. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 8, verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. That's kind of a shocking statement. Jesus was amazed at this centurion's faith. He's telling his followers he's not met anyone in all of Israel with faith like this centurion. Nothing. No one comparable. And I think this is such a stunning statement. It would have put the Pharisees back on their heels a little bit. Jesus declares that this Gentile soldier has the greatest faith in the entire country. Even greater than all the religious leaders that were probably not that far away. What is most surprising about the centurion's faith is that as a Gentile, he would have grown up in a heritage without all of the insights and teachings that come from the Old Testament, which would have given him a basic understanding of who the Messiah was and what he would do. The Old Testament has prophecies that predicted that the Messiah would actually have a healing ministry. We read this in Isaiah 35, verses five and six. It says, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped? Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy? The Pharisees would have known this, but they never made the connection between the prophecies about the Messiah being a healer and Jesus. At least they never recognized that publicly. The Pharisees missed these connections when Jesus fulfilled these prophetic passages. And yet the centurion, knowing nothing about these ancient predictions, sees Jesus as having this authority over disease and infirmity. Matthew said that Jesus was amazed. How often was Jesus amazed? My guess is as 
part of the creator of the universe? Not very often. But it says he was amazed, which would mean this man's faith was truly significant. Well, Jesus continued in verses 11 and 12. It says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What Jesus is giving us a picture of in these two verses refers to what is called by theologians as the messianic banquet. This was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah, God revealed that the Gentiles from all parts of the world will join the Jewish patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, at this feast that represents the kingdom of heaven. God will gather Israel from all parts of the earth and Gentiles from all quarters of the world and they will also worship God in the kingdom. Now, During the time of Jesus, the Jewish religious leaders had chosen to view themselves as uniquely privileged because of their relationship to the patriarchs. They were part of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This led them to basically write the Gentiles completely out of the kingdom, despite all these prophecies saying otherwise. So Jesus hits the reset button here because of the faith of this one centurion. Jesus reminds everyone, hey, just so you remember, the Gentiles will have a place in my Father's kingdom also. And then Jesus turns his attention back to the centurion. He says, says then, verse 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. As this encounter closes, Jesus emphasizes the importance of this centurion's faith in the healing of his servant. Did you catch what Jesus said there? He said, let it be done just as you believed it would. If the servant hadn't been healed, then the faith of the centurion wouldn't have been sufficient. But he was healed in that moment. The centurion came believing that Jesus would heal his servant. And that faith, Jesus said, was the standard in fact, it was the catalyst that activated the divine healing power of Jesus. This is an amazing story. A faith that comes from an unlikely source. Don't take the faith of others for granted. You might, be, you might actually be having an encounter with a centurion when you didn't expect someone to have that level of faith. Well, let me give you two takeaways to think about, to reflect on, even take steps to act on. The first is this, be courageous on behalf of those who need an encounter with Jesus. Be courageous on behalf of those who need to have an encounter with Jesus. The centurion's servant was suffering tremendously, so he was unable to go and meet Jesus. So. The centurion went to make an appeal on his behalf. His commander, he presented the situation to Jesus, seeking help for his friend, the servant. As a result, Jesus heals the paralyzed servant. This is an incredible example for us when there are people who we care about who need an encounter with Jesus. When we ask God to intervene or to do the miraculous in any given situation, we need to pray in faith, like this centurion was asking Jesus with faith. We pray confident that Jesus can fix whatever it is that's broken. And like the centurion, we should pray, just say the word, and my servant or my friend or my spouse or my child or my coworker will be healed. 
Pray like that. Pray with faith for those who need to have an encounter with Jesus. The second takeaway is this. If your faith is deficient, then ask God to strengthen it. If your faith is deficient, then ask God to strengthen it. If you are lacking in faith, then pray like the father in Mark the ninth chapter who, said, who exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When we lack faith, we have a privilege that is afforded to us. We can ask God for more faith. Grow it, Lord, stretch it. James says in James 1, 5, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If you need it, ask God for it. If you're lacking in faith, if you don't see how it works out, but you know God is able to do immeasurably more than you or I could ever ask or imagine, then pray for more faith. Ask God to expand it, to grow it. And then I wanna encourage you to make a list. I mentioned this a while back, but I wanna encourage you to make a list of people who you want to join you for Easter worship this year. Make this list and then start praying for them. Pray that they will say yes. Being confident that God can move them to join you on Easter and then invite them, invite them. And if you don't think they will come before you in, extend the invitation, I want you to pray asking God to help you overcome your unbelief. Is it possible that God could convince them to join us for Easter? Absolutely. So let's pray with faith for those who need an encounter with Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this remarkable soldier, the centurion, a man we don't know much about. We just have a few verses that encapsulate his narrative in all of scripture. God, I pray that we would have faith like that. We pray, God, asking you to strengthen our faith or grow our faith if it's lacking. I pray for all those who are listening to my voice right now, that their faith would grow as they seek you, that they would trust you more, that they would see that you are able to do more than they thought before. Expand our faith, God. And like this paralyzed servant, some of us need to have an encounter with you. Some have drifted from you over time. Some have never, ever investigated you. God, I pray that you would give every person who needs to have an encounter with Jesus the courage to call out to you, take steps to investigate the claims that Jesus made, the life that he lived. I pray for those that we know, that we love, who need Jesus to wash away their sins. God, please wake them up, get their attention, so that they realize the need they have for Jesus. We don't want anyone to miss out on a life with you, Lord. So give us the courage to invite, help us to pray with faith. Lord, build our list of people not just for Easter, but for heaven. God, we love you. We thank you that someone shared the good news about the gospel, a gospel that's for everyone. They shared it with us. And for that, God, we're forever grateful. And we pray that we'll be a conduit that will share that gospel with others as well. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, what a tremendous example of faith from the Roman centurion today. And what a reminder that even if your current outlook is dim, that in Christ, it won't always be this dark. And listen, if, you, if you'd like to reach out and, and unpack part of today's message or, or to talk or pray with someone, we encourage you to do so. 
right here, whatever device you're tuning in on, you can go to ncclex.org slash connect. And we would love to walk alongside you as you take steps toward Jesus. You know, each week we carve out time to worship through generosity. And, and we just say every week, and I hope you know that we mean this sincerely, thank you. Thank you for joining us on mission as we love the 40509 and beyond. So however you choose to give, I thank you for doing so. And what's really neat, today we actually have one of our ministry partners with us. CFR, Christian Financial Resources, um, is joining us and we, we want to talk about some of the amazing ways that God is working through this partnership. And so to kick it off, check out this video. So I have with us Shane Armstrong from CFR. Shane, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Been glad that you're here. And um, again, CFR is this, this really unique partnership. CFR has actually helped us by purchasing our loan and, and they've helped us to eliminate debt and quite a bit, in fact. Um, and CFR has helped us to eliminate $4.3 million worth of debt and prepayment penalties. And though we have a ways to go, mm -hmm. man, we are well on our way. So mm -hmm. we're so grateful. Yeah. And for this partnership. So Shane, I, mean, I just want to ask you, um, and how does CFR like actually help churches? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for letting me be here at Northeast and, and share some time with you guys. Just love your all's team. And it, it's just fun to share uh, some time together. Well, let me share with you a little bit about uh, CFR. Our, our mission is to fund ministry and change lives. And uh, we do that in a variety of different ways, but the, the way is that people decide they wanna take some of their funds and put it in reserve with us. Uh, we give them a good rate of return, all while using those funds to loan out to growing and thriving churches. And so the cool thing about that is, is that we see the buildings and the churches and the, the retreat centers. We all know, we get excited because we all know those are being tools that God uses for life change. And uh, you know, after 40 years, over 300 loans, partners through the country. We see that there's over a quarter million people coming to these churches today wow. and uh, over tens of thousands of baptisms that have taken place, changing lives for all of eternity. It's just cool to see. It is, it's a really unique partnership, man, because Northeast as a church, partnering with CFR is now connected to all of these other churches too. That's right, right. that's exactly it's, right. It's a kingdom-minded, yeah. gospel-driven yeah. mission. That's it's right. really, really neat. Um, but what's cool is it's not just for churches. Yeah. Like CFR has a lot of opportunities for families and individuals yep. to get connected as well. So how does CFR help out people? That's exactly right. Well, we, we believe that, you know, everybody has some kind of reserve fund. We believe kind of the Ramsey that everybody should have three to six months of reserve fund. Um, but there's three ways really that people, uh, businesses, organizations, churches can partner up with CFR on the investment side is that that uh, the first way is for everyone. Uh, we have a ready access account. Um, you can uh, link it to your checking account off of our website. Move your money back and forth as much as you want to as a, an on-demand account. And uh, there's no fees, no penalties, all while helping growing and thriving churches, just like Northeast. Uh, second way is for some people. Some people have a larger reserve and they want um, some funds and a time certificate. We can do that. And there's some people who have a job they've left and have this old retirement fund sitting not doing a whole lot. You can roll that into an account as well. The last way is for a few people. There's a few people who who give ten thousand or more dollars a year to to Northeast, the local church, or or maybe a local charity. Um, we have a giving fund that is kind of brand new. You can open up a giving fund and. 
and uh, lots of major benefits. It's like a charity checking account. Uh, lots of major tax benefits inside that. And all while, as we come to our, our time of tax season, right, is that it's, it's a thing that you only get one receipt at the end of the year. So that's kind of nice. Yeah, and you know what's interesting, man, whenever you talk about money in the church, people kind of get this yeah. this icky feeling. But yeah. what's, what's neat is, I mean, this is practical stuff. It's stuff that all of us are, are handling, right? It's resources and tools. Yeah. And so why not use your resources and tools to yeah. advance the kingdom? Yeah. So just really neat. Um, opportunities. Yeah. But so Shane, how can people man, take a next step? How can they get connected yeah. with CFR? Yeah. One of three ways for the most part for you all is um, uh, you will see that you can text CFR to the number on the screen, or you can go to our website, cfrministry.org, or you can um, uh, make a comment in the comments part and um, uh, someone from Northeast will let me know and I'll get in contact with you. Hey, absolutely, man. Hey, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate Thank you. what CFR is Thank doing. Thank you so much. Um, and so again, you can go to cfrministry.org um, or man, right there in the comments, get connected. But really excited about this partnership and continue forward with you guys. Um, and hey, listen, that's all we got today. Guys, thank you so much for being with us, for tuning in. And we can't wait to see you and connect real soon.